Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Multifamily Investing Podcast with me, Charles Dobbins, your multifamily real estate attorney, multifamily attorney. Uh, and it, it's good to be here. And I have a, have a friend of mine who's, oh, I've been on his podcast. Now he's, he's returning the courtesy, uh, Whitney Sewell. Whitney, how are you, buddy? I'm doing excellent. A pleasure to be here. Good, good, good. Good to see you. Now, uh, Whitney is, um, what we're going to talk about here on t- today's podcast is really, you know, why Whitney does what he does, what exactly he does, uh, and, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, a day in the life uh, of uh, being a syndication uh, expert when it comes to uh, multifamily investing. So, Whitney, welcome aboard, buddy. Honored to be here. Can't wait to do it. Good, good. Now, all right. So let me just let's talk a little personal uh, stuff here. Now, Whitney is uh, adopts kids. Uh, he's got two kids already. Um, you know, it's funny, Whitney. Uh, I'll tell you, be honestly, uh, my wife and I kicked around the idea of uh, of adopting, um, and uh, <laughs> and my father totally talked us out of it. I said, Dad, why are you so down on on us adopting? And I said. I said, you were an orphan yourself. And he said, yeah, and I know what kind of kids come out of orphanages. Look at me. I'm like, oh, okay, thanks, Dad. So that was, uh, that was his answer why we didn't do it. But you and your wife have taken it on. And I want to talk about the most recent situation, too, and you know, how people can help and, and what happened. So, so share with us. And then I want to t- talk about how that all ties into your investing, your multifamily investing. So give us the backdrop. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it is. It's it's very connected to our real estate business now because it's a big passion of ours. Yeah. We actually just brought home number three through adoption. Yeah. Now, where, when you say brought home, where 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 was the child? Uh, she was born in Florida. Oh, really? Oh, okay, cool. All, all right. So it's a, you know, a, a local adoption, essentially a local adoption. Well, so yeah, yeah where, where, domestic. Where you, anyway. Yeah, domestic. Where are you from? Where, where I live in Virginia. Okay. Okay. All right, right. That's cool. That's so cool. All right, so um, where were the other two kids from? Uh, our first son was born in Ethiopia, and our second was born in Utah. Well, Utah is kind of like a foreign country. You know? it really, <laughs> it really is. My mother was the my mother was the worst at geography when we uh, uh, when she met my wife. Uh, she said, my mother was a brilliant woman, brilliant woman, could do the New York Times crossword puzzle in no time flat, but she was terrible at geography, and she. Um, uh, met my wife and she said, oh, where, where are you from? And my wife says, I'm from Michigan. And my, my mother said, oh, what state is that in? And uh, so, yeah, so we always said my mother, my mother was terrible at geography, but she knew where Manhattan was. That's, that's a joke there, Whitney. <laughs> oh, uh, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, but there was a little snafu here with the, the last adoption. What happened? So, I mean, there's so many details and, and many that I, I won't share publicly, but, you know, yeah. happy to share with people who are interested in adopting and, and happy to help in any way. But, uh, but long story short, you know, we were in the process of, of adopting a child and, and were matched with a birth mother, you know, for or since like December. And we were there. And we'd made numerous trips to Florida to meet with her and, and the agency. And we were actually there with her the night before and before the birth. And then she changed her mind. And so, you know, it's, it's a major emotional setback and major uh, financial loss as well. And, uh, but, you know, uh, we, we still support her, you know, and, and just pray for her and the child. And, yeah. and, and so, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. And, and so we, you know, but, you know, thankfully the Lord had other plans and we were quickly matched with another child, another birth mother. And that process actually went very smooth. And we just got home about 5 a.m. Uh, Monday morning. Uh, with, oh, wow. with our third child. So, Oh, wow. Now here's something that people don't understand. And, and that, you know, I, I think this is, uh, you know, the public uh, service that I can provide here is that, I mean, obviously it costs a lot of money to adopt. Uh, you know, you've got to pay the agency, you've got to, you know, who knows all the other you know, legal fees and what have you. But yes, but when that adoption fell through, you lost everything, everything that you'd spent to that up to that point. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, we're talking, you know, 40 to 60,000 normally, wow. you know, unfortunate, it's very unfortunate. I mean, there's, you know, over 160 million orphans worldwide. And for some reason, it takes us two years to, to bring a child home and, and, you know, an almost annual salary for most people. And, yeah. 
Yeah. And so that's, that's where LifeBridge Capital comes in. And that's why, you know, we've committed half of our profits to helping families that, that will commit to adopting. And I, I hear it all the time, uh, Charles. It's like, you know, Whitney, we would love to adopt, but that's, that's more than we make in a year. Yeah. You know, how, how could we do that? And so that's where we're, you know, creating this, this way for people to, to be able to still commit to adopting and us help them through the process. Well, I've got two kids you can adopt too. They'll only cost you about forty to $60,000 a year as well. <laughs> But I got two more years to go, brother, and I'm and I'm done. But okay, so so let's talk about LifeBridge Capital. I want to talk about uh, first off what its mission is, why you started it, you know, and and how it works, and also how it ties into multifamily because people are probably wondering like, why why you got a guy on on your uh, call about uh, about uh, adopting? Well, right. listen up, folks. Watch watch Whitney as he puts it all together for you. And, yeah. And, yeah. So, you know, I'll say back in 2009, a little history about me. I was working as a police officer at Kentucky State Police, and I, I, I loved working the road as an officer. You were a state trooper? I was. I was, I was with yeah, Kentucky what, State Police. you lose Police. like 100 pounds since then or something? Like, you know, you don't look, you don't have that. So, were you out on the streets or were you? It, it's those- all about how, how your uniform looks. It's all about, you know, I mean, people probably, know if you're squared away or not. You probably had to wear three bulletproof vests just to, look, you know, just to, you know, look like a trooper. Because, yeah. And those of you that aren't watching, uh, uh, I think I could take Whitney, which is not saying much. Okay, so well. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it was a great. It was, I, I enjoyed working the road, and uh, but quickly realized that there was no path for you know making more money or even hardly making a living. It's very unfortunate. But uh, so in came real estate, and quickly bought a couple triplexes and made a lot of mistakes and yeah. and learned a lot the hard way. And you know over numerous years, then bought and sold different properties. And we moved to Virginia for a federal position, which is most law enforcement's like dream. Um, you know to to move up that way. However. It's still a job, and so you know the real estate business started to grow. And and well, hold on, hold on. What okay. um, can I ask you? What federal pol- police uh, branch you you were in, or maybe still are in, or so? Yeah, so I, so I worked for an agency under the Department of Transportation, USDOT. Oh, okay, okay, cool. All yeah, right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was a great a great job, but uh, however, it's still a job. And yeah. and I got up to like a fifteen unit property, but it was still you know it was hard to scale, and I'd never heard of syndication honestly at that time. And the more, you know, I was exposed to syndication, the more I learned about it, I thought, okay, this is, this is the path I'm, I'm shooting for. I can see myself growing this business and, and just like the business model and being able to grow a professional business as opposed to me looking for another single family or duplex or yeah. something like that. And, and so, so that's what I did. I jumped in with both feet. I actually had another business at the time that I just completely cut off so I could just focus on this. And, uh, you know, started networking like mad and, and then just really jumped into uh, growing, you know, capital raising and looking for apartment buildings. And, you know, now uh, obviously podcast, you know, daily show and, and uh, you know, we're doing a lot now, uh, you know, as, as far as promoting our business and growing it. But, you know, at, at, during that time when my, my wife and I were exposed to adoption, we had never considered adopting before and this was back at the end of 2011 and we heard a pastor talk about how david platt how he had talked how they had adopted and how the lord had worked in their family and on our way home my wife and i were just like why why would we not adopt like we can't think of a good reason why we wouldn't why we wouldn't do that and so yeah you didn't have my father obviously (laughs) well it was that simple and honestly we didn't consult with our family at that time (laughs) you know for good you know i mean because it was just it would have been a private thing it's a private decision absolutely and so So we knew that's what, you know, Lord had for us and our family. And, and so within a week, we turned in, we submitted an application to adopt from Ethiopia. Wow. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so my, uh, my wife was really had, had, you know, led that and all the paperwork that comes in. I mean, it's just massive amounts of paperwork, but, uh, oh uh, but, but unfortunately it was two years to the month until, you know, our first son came home from Ethiopia. We had to make two trips to Ethiopia. I mean, they called us on Monday and said, your court appointment is on Thursday in Ethiopia. You know, so if you can imagine the cost of those last oh, minute international flights. and I, you know, I was just about to ask, what does that cost you? Yeah. Yeah. The flights alone were around 10,000. Uh, I mean, that was for twice. I mean, that's for two trips over there and back, but still it's, it's, you know, I would, you so it's, and I say this, you know, people say, Oh, wait, that's just crazy. Why would you spend that much? And I say, well, okay, Charles, what if, what if somebody took your child, took them to Ethiopia, you know, or any country yeah, and said, right. it's going to cost you a million dollars to get them back. What are you going to say? Nope. Sorry. Yeah, that's too much money. You I know. know. So that's the way we look at it. We say, you know, that's our child. And, and so, you know, if, unfortunately, if the governments, you know, are corrupt or whatever it may be, and they say it's going to cost this much money, you know, that's not the child's fault. We're going to make it happen. 
You know, with $10,000 for the airline ticket, you know what I, over to go down and see my son in, in uh, George Mason down in Virginia, you know what I, uh, you know what I ended up doing? I bought a plane and now I, now I fly down there with my own plane just to see him. But man, right. that's, uh, oh gosh, that's, uh, that's, uh, but the way you describe it, when you put it in those terms, of course, that's what you would do. Right. You absolutely would do that. That's, uh, that makes total sense. Wow. So, all right. So you, so you get the syndication. So you get into, into real estate, you're doing everything right. You've, you've got the, you've got the, the, the income coming in and at the same time you're building that, that other business, that's going to you know carry you into the future. So uh, talk to me about your process with syndication. Now you're not a, an SEC attorney. You're um, you know, and I'll get into some terms uh, in a moment, but kind of describe for me your, your process here. For the syndication business? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we started the syndication business outside of small multifamily. I've said, okay, this is, you know, I can see, you know, just developing a professional business here and being able to scale quickly. Uh, you know, we just jumped in, uh, you know, both feet. And, and you know, that's when the podcast was birthed to, you know, and we put in a lot of work there, obviously, and still are, uh, just to help grow our network and keep growing and growing. And I have a partner that lives in Denver. And, we, you know, we're doing deals now in Colorado Springs and, and looking in some other markets as well. But, uh, um, but you know, as far as the the adoption side of it, you know, personally, we've committed half of our profits to helping these families, you know, and so that's, that's our big why, you know, okay. but how we get there is through multifamily syndication. And, and obviously, you know, it doesn't affect our investors returns, but most of them like to, you know, enjoy the fact that they're playing a role in that goal or mission as well. Okay, I'm going to give you a tip right now. So you're going to get ready to write this down, because this is something I just, just uh, uncovered with one of my students um, is the uh, you know, you know, obviously what a Fannie Mae dust lender is, a delegated underwriter and servicer. Go do a Google search on dust lenders. There'll be a one page, a Fannie Mae page listing all their dust lenders. Click on each dust lender. It's a, every every uh, logo is a hyperlink that takes you right to these dust lenders. And not all of them, but the majority of them have a you know, property owned tab. And so they own some properties that they're looking to unload. And I, you know, quickly, what I always do is I take that in the name of that property, I stick it into LoopNet to see if they're advertising it on LoopNet and they're not. So these are all a kind of not, you know, below the radar uh, deals. And I found a couple from Colorado in there. So, uh, you know, that might be, yeah. So there, there, that's, that's my, that's my public service for the, for the moment. And, uh, you know, we're going to get back to yours right now. So, so you got this partner you're out there, you're, who's, who, how are you transacting these properties? Are you owning and operating them yourselves? Are you acting as a syndication aggregator for the investor? How are you putting the, these deals together? So initially, that's how I got started was, you know, partnering with other uh, sponsors that already have, a, you know, a big track record and are, you know, have great deals and deal flow and, you know, building my network and really coming under their wing. Uh, but we're, we're doing our own deals now. You know, I, like I said, I have a partner that's really boots on the ground and, and, and it's allowed us to grow faster, but it's allowed us to really split our roles, you know, within the yep. business and him to really specialize in one area, me and another. And, and so it's, it's helped in a big way and helps us to really push one another, you know, he's more on the underwriting and asset management and, you know, and I'm more obviously marketing and capital raising, investor relations, all those things, uh, you know, where he's, you know, he's boots on the ground right there. Excellent. Excellent. So what, where are you guys right now? Are you in a deal right now? Are you, you know, raising funds for a deal or are you just raising funds for a fund? Or are you doing a one-off type of syndication? Where are you now in the process? Good question. And we, we don't have a fund. It's all deal specific, deal okay. specific funds. And so we closed on a property about seven or eight weeks ago now. And, and we're looking at some other deals, you know, in that same market. He toured a couple of properties there yesterday. And, and we have another off-market deal there that we're strongly considering. But, uh, uh, but yeah, we're, we're always looking at, at okay. deals. Like okay. Now, let me ask you about that because... Um, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the, 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 uh, the bugaboo among multifamily investors is do you raise funds for a one-off or do you have you create your own fund? And obviously the easiest way to do it is to create your own fund. But typically the only way you're able to do that is if you've got a few deals under your belt and then, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and then until you're able to do that, you've got to do one-offs, which, you know, Whitney, I'll, I'll tell you, in my experience, that's when you don't sleep at night is when you're doing a one-off deal and you're syndicating it. You are 
running as fast as you possibly can. That's right. As soon as it goes under contract, for sure, you oh are you're wide open. <laughs> exactly. no doubt about it. And, and that's a great point about doing a fund as well. And, and I, we would love to do that eventually. But personally, I feel like I would like to have a much longer relationship with a lot more investors, you know, before we decide to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, I want them to just have, you know, see a longer track record. I want them to see more success, you, yeah. know, before they're, you know, before I expect them to invest with us blindly, really. Yeah, I'll tell you, one of my, one of my best clients, he's got about 6,000 units, and his investors just stay with him. Like, yeah. he, he sells the deal, and they're like, okay, take my money, go do it again. And it just, it just starts to flow that way. That's, and it's so easy for him. You know, brokers just bring him deals, and he picks and chooses now because he can close quickly uh, because yeah. he's got the money, and he built it up from zero yeah, we've seen that as well, you know, with even investors of ours that have been in every deal, you know, and, and they're ready, you know, and they trust us even now, you know, just to, you know, for the next deal. Uh, and so, yeah, it's great. It's neat to see that happen and yeah. move through that transition. Now, let me ask you something from a, from a operational standpoint, because I've done a little investigating on you with her, Whitney. Uh, and, you know, I checked out lifebridgecapital.com uh, and, you know, just let's talk about, you, you know, the, from the marketing aspect of it. I mean, your website is very simple and it should be. Uh, uh, but I think the, the call to action on your website is that, that free report. And so from there you capture the person's name. Do you, how do you, uh, interact with those, those people that you, that, whose names you capture? Do you, and some, I've, I've seen other, other, uh, investors, uh, websites where they have the investor actually fill out, a, a, an, you know, almost an accredited investor questionnaire right then and there on the, fo on the form. How do you work with, I mean, because these are your customers. So how do you work with your customers? That's a great point. And it's such a tedious system of getting people through that process, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, first just getting them to the website, but then getting them to sign up and then actually moving to a phone call. You know I mean? Like it's a lot to, to get them to that point. And that's what we're working towards, right? Okay. A big, go ahead. You have a oh, question. So, so you, oh no, I'm, I'm going to get to the, the one thing that you just said that, that, uh, you know, makes me very happy to hear is, is the phone call. So why don't you go through your process and tell me about the phone yeah, call? Yeah. So, you know, a pet peeve I would say of mine is getting an, an investment offering from somebody that I've never spoken to before. You know, I'm like, you, you know, we've never talked before. I have no clue who you are, you know? Yeah. So it's a, it's a must of mine to talk to you before, I mean, and probably numerous times before, you're ever going to see a deal from me. Yep. And so, you know, so the first thing is, I, first thing is I want to make it so easy for you to sign up on the website, even if it's just an email, right? You know, then you're going to be in, introduced to us and you're going to start seeing me more often, right? Through different ways, whether it's podcasts, newsletters, things like that, or me reaching out personally, trying to schedule a call with you. You know, if you provide your phone number, you know, I'm going to reach out a few times and eventually I'm going to call you you know, and try to talk to you. But my goal is, you know, like you talk about that investor form. I don't want all those questions, honestly, on the website, because a lot of people aren't going to sign up. They're not going to take the time. And, and so, you know, I, I want to have that call with you. And pretty much I'm going to be filling out a form like that myself as okay, I'm talking right. to you, you know, and so, you know, then that's what I'm going to be asking, you know, about your ex investing experience and your real estate experience. Do you understand, you know, it's all at risk and, you know, things like that. What's your goals in investing? You know, what's your, per you know, what's the perfect passive investment for you and, and learning if this is a good fit or not, but it's all, you know, I want to get to that phone call and I want to get to know you and understand what your goals are and make sure that this is a good fit uh, before, like I said, you're ever going to see an investment offering from me, but that's, that's the process getting you to the website, whether it's from the podcast or some other way, you know, you get there, you sign up and then we start, you know, communicating with you. Okay. Let me tell you something. What you just said and the way you described it is you'd get an A in my class uh, in the owner <laughs> form because one of the things that, uh, you know, you've got to understand first off, like I said, these people are your customers and it would always burn me up when I would uh, you know, listen to one of my students say, Hey, I just had a meeting with an investor and he's got a hundred thousand dollars to invest with me. I'm like, okay, what, what, what kind of deal is he looking to invest in? <laughs> well, well, I don't know. Like, and so then when they finally get a deal on the contract, they send it to that, this guy and says, nah, nah, I'm not interested. Well, he had a hundred thousand dollars. What happened to a hundred thousand dollars? Because you didn't ask the right questions. You didn't find out the flavor of his money. You didn't ask the question, the million dollar question, which is, Hey, if I had a deal right now where you would put your $100,000 in, what would that deal look like? What would it have to look like for you to say yes? And then that just, that helps direct you as to how to structure your deal. 
when the time comes because, hey, I've got an investor that he needs 8% you know, preferred returns. Okay, fine. Maybe I need to structure my deal that way. So that, it is, you know, when you talk about this questionnaire, and I can understand why you wouldn't want to put this stuff on the, uh, on the internet and have them fill it out in a form, but it's definitely something you want to have a conversation with. That's right. And one question I, I'll say I like to ask people when we get on the phone sometimes the first time is, is I'll say, what's been the highlight of your week? And, and, and that tells me a lot about that person, you know, because they're, they're going to say, oh, you know, I got to spend so much time with my kids this week or, you know what, you know, I've just been at work all week or, you know what, I, I've been in the doctor's room all week, you know, because I've been sick, you know, like you're, you're going to start to learn about what's important to them, whether it's, you know, spending time with their kids or, or maybe it's this job that they're really passionate about. And so, you know, it allows you to figure out, okay, they are really looking to be passive or, or no, they're growing their own real estate business or, you know, it helps you to, to kind of lay that foundation to figure out what, what they're looking for. She said, you know, I, I hear one guy say like, Hey, what's the highlight of your week? He's like, well, we've got my wife, her own criminal defense attorney. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's oh man. That's not good. That's not a good week. That's Next question. Question. <laughs> kind of like want to kind of maneuver the conversation in a different direction. Right. Um, all right. So, so once you get the, you know, you start, start to start that initial relationship with that, with that investor, how does your system work uh, in order to maintain contact with these people? Um, you know, what do you do on a systematic basis? Great question. Great question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's heard CRM. Hey, Whitney, you think I've done this before a couple of times? <laughs> A few times. And, and yes. it's, it's awesome that you're coaching so many people too. So, you know, good questions, you yeah. know, figure out how people are doing this. And, and the thing is, I'll tell you something, Whitney, the, what you do is what every one of my students should be doing because it is such a crucial part of a multifamily real estate investment management business. Uh, you know, the marketing and the raising of the capital is not, uh, you know, we, we use the term one-off but it is not a one-off process. Yeah. It is a gradual building process and you're doing it, you're doing it exactly the right way. Yeah, I, I've seen it. It's, it's been incredible to watch too, how, how it will grow over time and over deals and just the relationships with these investors. It, it's, yeah. it's just, it's been really fun to watch that happen and watch it grow. But, but key, uh, the key, the most important part is the follow-up and some kind of follow-up. And, and I like to have a personal follow-up. And, and so, you know, while investor, well, let me back up, you know, you ask about our process. And so, you know, they sign up, we start to try to schedule a call. I, you know, my, my whole goal then is to get on the phone with that individual. And, you know, and if they don't sign up automatically through some like automatic, you know, email campaigns, things like that, you know, where they can see my calendar and schedule a link, then I'm personally going to email them and, and try to schedule a call, you know, and then I'm going to be more direct. I'm going to say, you know, hey, Charles, I appreciate your interest in LifeBridge Capital. Capital, you know, you signed up on the website. I'd love to have a call with you. What about Friday at 9 a.m.? Oh, you know, and, and so, yeah. you know, be very direct then. What about Friday at 9 a.m.? Question mark and don't say anything else. And so, you know, make it very short and sweet. And then a lot of people will respond then, you know, where they didn't have time to read the other emails. They're like, oh, yeah, okay. I, I knew I wanted to talk to him, but just hadn't got around to it. You know, and then all of a sudden we can get on the phone for a few minutes. And then that's, the, you know, the beginning of our relationship. But, but then after that, you know, hopefully then I understand what they're looking for. I understand what their desires are in passive investing. And, you know, and if we're a good fit, I make sure they understand some of the risk and, and how to move forward. But then I'm going to start to educate them some too. And whether it's through our newsletters, through things, through the podcast, you know, they're in my CRN, CRM then I'm going to try to make sure I'm following up, you know, uh, fairly often. Uh, they're going to get a weekly newsletter from us, you know, that's, uh, that my assistant mostly does. And, uh, but then eventually they're going to get another follow-up from me, you know, to do another phone call so I can have another call. And, and I'm track, I'm taking notes about every one of these phone calls. And so then, you know, when, when I get back on the phone with you again, Charles, you know, I can look back at my notes and say, okay, he's got two kids there in this college or whatever you told me about, you know, and what's important to you. And so I can talk about that later. I do care about those things, but when I'm talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, honestly, it's hard to remember all those details, yeah. right? Yeah. But I want to be able to go back and say, you know, how, how are your kids doing? You know, how's, you know, little John doing whatever, you know, uh, you know, is he getting, is he feeling better? Or, you know, how's your wife doing? Is she out of the hospital now? Or, you know, how's that work, you know, that job promotion whatever it was that was on your mind, I want to track that. And so I can follow up with you about it. Even, even, you know, while we're on the phone, I may even create a task for myself, say, Hey, follow up with Charles about, you know, his kids, whatever that, that you told me was happening two months from now. 
you know, like follow up at this time. And so I may send you an email and say, Hey Charles, what, you know, what's going on with this or how'd that go? You know, just just to show that, you know, I, I do care about what's happening with you and just to have another interaction. Okay. Uh, I just, okay. I've got uh, six things that I just wrote down <laughs> that I've been talking about. I know it's like, Oh my gosh, here we go. First off, have you, have you ever read the book shoe dog? I have not. Okay. It's about the founder of Nike and it, it, everyone in my family read it. We just absolutely loved it. Cause I mean, I was, I was a big runner back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually wore test for Nike shoes. They, I was one of the test test runners for Nike. Um, and I, I, I told my kids, I was uh, New Hampshire. Uh, they asked me if I, you know, uh, I was New Hampshire state junior masters champion in, uh, in pretty much all running events in, uh, when I was growing up. And I tell that to my kids all the time. I'm like, wow, dad, that, ah, wow, yeah, I was New Hampshire State Junior Masters champion. And then uh, they came to realize as they started getting older that dad was New Hampshire State Junior Masters champion at everything he did. And I think when my oldest daughter was 20, 12 years old, she said, dad, have you ever played ping pong? Yeah, I was New Hampshire State Junior Masters champion. So, <laughs> wait a minute. Ah. So, anyway, the point of the shoe dog is that uh, the Nike, uh, Knight, uh, Phil Knight's uh, first employee, was another runner that he ran with the University of Oregon. And this guy had gone on to do some work down in California. He was running track events down in California and he hired this guy. And this guy was a little quirky and he was kind of strange, but he was passionate about what he did. So much so that he basically was the whole marketing department for Nike early on. He would actually hand write letters to people that bought shoes and send them off to them like, hey, how are you? How's your event? And he kept tabs on everything. And he built up this incredible database before we had databases, you know, uh, to, to build uh, of just customers. And he kept in touch with all of them. And that's, that's what kept the company going early on. And, you know, that, that's kind of what you're describing here is setting up the systems in order to Hey, how many kids does this guy have? What are their birthdays? What are they into? You know, and, and if something triggers in your mind, you're going to send something off to that person, which then brings me to the second book. Have you ever read the book by Harvey McKay, um, how to swim with the sharks without being eaten alive? I have not. Okay. That one is very, look at last time you and I spoke, uh, Whitney, you didn't even know who Don Rickles was. So I'm not surprised that you don't know who, uh, who, um, uh, Harvey McKay is. But Harvey K. McKay owned an envelope manufacturing company, and he was a master uh, marketer, and he kept tabs on everybody. He had a system for, he just kept information about all of his customers, and he would constantly be like, hey, this might be good for this person. And I can just see, like, you having that type of a relationship, or, or you, you know, uh, if you're looking to raise money from these people, that's, like you said, you want, this is the type of relationship you want to have. Which brings me to my third point was what CRM do you use to keep track of all of these customers? And for those of you that don't know, customer relationship management system. Now, there's so many different types. Um, you know, so, so what one do you use? Uh, the main thing that I use for tracking those conversations is called Contactually. And Contactually was really built for realtors, uh, but, but it, it works really well for us in this business. And it, I mean, it's, it's worked really well for me. I've used it a couple of years now. Uh, and I, I've debated it times to switch, but, but, it, but it works really well. I can't find anything else that really does everything that, that it can do. The automation side of it's uh, kind of lacking, but as far as the tracking the customer interactions and things like that and keeping notes of calls and things, it, it, and even reminding you to contact people is really good. Like it's contactually.com? Yes. Man, I've never even heard of it. That's, that's me. I'm going to check it out as soon as we're off the call now. All right. But the, the other thing I wrote down here about you do newsletters and you do podcasts and the whole purpose of these uh, vehicles, obviously podcasts you do to reach out to, to find new people, but your existing uh, database captures the, you know, the, their names and they get the newsletter. And you know, what type of stuff do you put on your newsletter? 
the newsletter is a lot, a lot of links to like shows of that week, you know, or things that we've learned that week, you know, that it just help, you know, just showing people what, you know, what they can go listen to. They're, they're all links, you know, they can click right on it and find specific shows that they, you know, find that fit their needs or their goals. You know, obviously stuff that I've done, like this interview, obviously, you know, we'll put in there, hey, you know, it was Whitney was interviewed here, uh, you know, and this is maybe what was discussed, you know, you can listen to it at this link, you know, or, you know, obviously, you know, to contact me and or joining the Facebook group or ways that, that they can grow their network and, and that they can learn more about me and what we're doing and just staying active in our business at LifeBridge. All right. Now, let me, I'm, I'm going to ask you some specifics and, you know, you know, you can explain them, but how long have you been doing this as far as you handling the marketing for the syndication of your business? How long have you been going after it full steam? Or like even when you just first started? So I would I, say uh, probably uh, the syndication side of multifamily, probably um, a year and a half to two years. Okay. All right. So, so you're still new at it. Let me ask you something. Uh, you know, you're obviously always building your list and what have you, but like, give me an idea of, of, you know, what, uh, after a year and a half, how many, uh, potential investors should a person have in their database? I, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's like, listen, uh, Every, every uh, internet marketer like myself, and I, I, I have to put myself in that category, we've built our database list. My database is probably about 12,000 names right now, but only about 2,000 people really interact on a regular basis. That's just the way it is in, in this business. So how, what, you know, how does your database work for you? So you know, I would say, you know, and a lot of people ask me this, you know, was it worth all the time doing a daily podcast? You oh, know, that's we've a been, great question. That's you know, a great question. Is it worth it? You know, I get that all the time. And I say, absolutely. Um, you know, and, but I also say, I follow up with, it is a ton of work. I mean, it is a load of work. However, you, you have to, you can't expect to really see a return from some type of thought leadership platform for probably a year. I usually tell people count on doing it a year before you actually see yeah. it start to take, you know, just really take off. Yeah. And it's, it's worked really well for us. You know, it's really, it's promoted our brand really quickly. Most people in the industry know who I am now, you know, yeah. really fast. And I did. Hey, that's how I found out about you. My, my podcast, uh, uh, scheduler, uh, you know, connecting me with you. I'm like, Whitney Sewell? Never heard of the guy. And yeah. look at now. Yep. Now we're helping each other out. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So, you know, during that time, the, the podcast, obviously, you know, it takes that time. We, we track it, you know, it grows every month. And, and, but, you know, initially, you know, I, I increased my network by traveling to conferences more than the podcast, you know, but now the initially. podcast, yes, but now the podcast is obviously taking off more, more yep. people know about it, even more people are going back and listening to old shows. And, you know, I know of passive investors that are, if they, maybe they want to invest with, with Charles and they're just learning about you and, and, but they, you know, but they find you on my podcast and they go yeah. back and listen to your episode before they ever call you. Uh, you, know, you know, that, that is, that is the one thing that is amazing about these podcasts is you go to those network events, you're just meeting those people in the room and that's it. But you go on the podcast. Well, guess what? The 12,000 people on my list are going to get an email with Whitney Sewell's name on it that, you know, they didn't even know who he was before. Now they're going to be tapping into you that you can't beat that from a, going to a conference. And that's why, you know, like you said, this is a lot of work. But guess what? It's a heck of a lot easier than planting tobacco. And, you know, it, I've done my share of that. Believe exactly. I, 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 first time I, you're in Kentucky. I was in Kentucky. And I, when I was in high school, I did a, went on a mission trip and uh, had to plant tobacco for a family out in, out in uh, uh, northern Kentucky, out in Appala Appalachia. So, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'll never forget those days of, of, of planting and cutting and, and spearing that tobacco and hanging it up in the barn. That's, yeah, that's a lot of work. Well, they told us we were working on a farm. Everybody uh, came down. We all lived in this one farm, and they were saying, like, listen, you can only drink the water that's, in the, uh, that's on the farm. Uh, don't, when you go out to job sites, don't drink the water on the, on the job sites. Only drink the water here. And so they sent myself and this other guy out to help out this one uh, guy whose um, father was in the hospital and he had to plant the tobacco in a certain amount of time. So we, get, we went out there and, uh, and planted the tobacco like 90 degree heat on our, on our hands and knees. My, my, my mother had to throw the jeans away because they, they were just so far gone. And we see the guy walk over to the stream and like just start drinking water out of the stream. And the, the other guy and I are looking at each other like, well, they told us not to drink the water out here. Maybe we shouldn't do it. And so we went into the guy's house. Uh, I, I asked him, I said, hey, can we drink that water? He goes, 99% clean. 
clean water. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't know about that. So we go into his house for lunch, feeds us lunch. He gives us some water. I'm like, hey, is it okay to drink this water? And he looks at me and goes, 99% clean water. I said, you mean you're getting it out of that stream? He goes, yes, we are. I said, that's good enough for me. I'm just taking, I'm just taking it. So, yeah, you yeah, got to have some at that point. That was my Kentucky experience. Uh, so, and here you are, you know, a state trooper in Kentucky, man. <laughs> Jeez, Whitney, I got to ask you, how old are you? 35. All right. Yeah. You're not, you're not a spring chicken anymore. Jeez. Man. Sure you, I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, good for you. All right. So, so let's get back to my question here about, about building this network and, and, you know, uh, what would you do differently if you were started this process all over again? How would you go about it differently? Cause I think everything that you're doing right now is exactly what needs to be done. It absolutely has to be done. Um, so you're doing, in my estimation, you're doing everything right. So from a guy that's done it for the last couple of years, what would you do differently? You know, systems are, are everything. And, and I, that's where I've, I've, I've done better or I've done well at systems and, and creating a daily show made me create a team, build a team and have many good systems in place to make that happen. I was still working full time and doing a daily podcast while also, you know, raising capital, doing deals. I mean, it's, you know, is a lot to manage, obviously going through the adoption process and family and trying to spend time with them. You know, at my, at my, I would say my wife is extremely supportive and understanding or else I could not do this because there's, mm. there's mornings I'm taking calls at 5 a.m. and sometimes till 10 or 11 and, you know, still working at midnight, you know, and so it, it's just, you know, you got to be willing to put the time in. But one thing I would say that I, I would have understood better is the internal system. Some of what we already discussed today is like, okay, I've got the podcast going, what do I do with the people now that they sign up? Yeah, yeah. You know, and initially I did not have that down and okay. that's taken some time. And so, you know, I know there's people that even signed up with me initially that I didn't get back to quick enough or yeah. I didn't have a good system. That, like I was yeah. so focused on the podcast. It was such a big undertaking that I couldn't go over here and focus on building this system that was really just as important. I mean, it's the whole reason we're doing the podcast, right? You yeah. know, just connect with these people, you know, and to educate and, promote, you know, all those things. But, uh, but now that somebody signed up, I didn't understand what to do with them then. And, you know, we've improved that numerous times now, uh, but I would have better understood the back end system of what to do with that potential investor once we've started that relationship. Okay. Uh, I tell you, Whitney, you, you just nailed a couple of things that I've been teaching all of my students that, that in order, this is a business, it must be run like a business and for it to be a successful business, one that you can, you can scale and you can step away from at some point, you must have systems in place. Now, let me throw another book out at you. Have you read uh, The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber? I've not. I've heard of that one many times, but I've, okay. I've not read The uh, Revisited. Okay, you've got to read that. It's a good, easy read, and it's all about creating systems in your business. That's what you have to do. It's all about creating systems. And what you're talking about here is the same thing that, uh, same issue that I had in my business or starting out. And let me, let me throw a term at you. It's like you failed to create the funnel. And, you know, you, you get people into the funnel, and when they come into the funnel, that's the that's when you strike with the, with the, the, that's when the iron is hottest. That's when you strike because, Hey, they're interested. They're, they give you my, your email address, their email address. They want to find out more and you have right. to have that funnel that takes them through the process and right down to where they become an investor. Uh, and that is, you know, it's what you are saying here is so true that when you, even when you build that system, you have to think of the end game. What's, what's my ultimate objective here? I want to turn this person into a customer and have them invest with me. Well, how do I do that? I've got to take them through that system. And that's part of the process. Listen, I just spent big money on a guy to build my funnel so that I can take people's names down the funnel and get them into my, my uh, owner form program. That's but right. you know, you, you, and what you're, cause that's, that's, that's what it is in this business. And you and I, believe it or not, are in the same business from this syndication, what you're doing with your, with your uh, capturing names, what have you is getting people from point A to point B and in a systematic order that, that is easy and doesn't destroy your life. And, you know, you work half a day and then you're done, you know? So that's right. Yeah. It's amazing. So Whitney lifebridgecapital.com is the name of your website. I recommend everybody go check it out. 
and fill out the form and see if Whitney calls you. Like, you know, see, like, let's, Go let's, through the process. In, let's inundate them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that'll be cool. Cause I'd love to see you do well. Cause you're doing good things. And, uh, and, uh, I tell you, Whitney, this has been a fantastic phone call. Uh, I'm going to recommend this uh, podcast for, uh, all of my, all of my students, uh, for them to see exactly what they also need to be building. Everybody thinks they can, Oh, all I have to do is just go out there and make offers. And, and, uh, you know, the money will come. Nope. You got to build the system. You got to build the system. And Whitney Sewell is doing it with lifebridgecapital.com. Thanks buddy. Hey, any more kids? Or are you guys done? No, we hope to keep adopting. We, we um, won't. I mean, it's such a, we just want to rest a little bit because the yeah. adoption process is such a roller coaster, just mentally really rest a little bit. Uh, but I would imagine we'll start another process before too long because it takes so long. You yeah. know, it could take up to two years. And, and so, we, you know, we don't want to wait too long to get started again on another process. And, and so we, we'd love to bring a lot more kids home, but, uh, but hopefully it doesn't take us that long again. Okay. I, am, uh, I don't know if this podcast is out yet, but I did a podcast with Bill Menacero. Mm -hmm. uh, of old dogs, uh, real estate, D A W G old dogs.com. You have to listen to that podcast. Uh, Bill ran, a, uh, was on the mission field. He ran an orphanage down in Haiti and he adopted two or three kids, uh, down there. And I got to tell you, I honestly think that, think that was one of the funniest, funniest podcasts I've ever done. And he is such a nice guy and you would love that conversation. You will absolutely enjoy it. So make sure when that comes out, you check it, you check it out. I will. I'll look it up. Good. All right. Thanks, Whitney. It's been great having you. And I hope, I hope the best for you. You're doing awesome things. I'm so glad you're not a state trooper anymore for a whole host of reasons, not the least of which is I drive a little fast in, on Kentucky Road. So <laughs> uh, I'm glad I meet you here and not anywhere else. So I, I, would, I would like to say if anybody is interested in adopting, my wife and I schedule calls with couples all the time. And more, the more I talk about this in the real estate business, I find people in, in the real estate business, you know, will say, hey, Whitney, you know, my wife and I have thought about adopting. And, and you know, then they'll reach out and We'll schedule a call with them and just answer your questions from our experience and, and you know, just help you along the way. We'd love to do that. Um, you know, you can email me, Whitney at LifeBridge Capital or 540-585-4338. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Go slow with that. That's the most important number and, you, and you're saying it too fast. Go ahead. Say it slowly. Give it to me again. 540-585-4338. That's awesome. All right. That'll bring right to Whitney's uh, penthouse uh, office. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you can all chat with them right there. Whitney, thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to see you again. I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face. Yes, thank you very much. I'm honored to be on your show, Charles. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.